is the final session, the plenary five, uh, before the closing ceremony. And this session is entitled Asia Pacific Digital Health and Artificial Intelligence and Regulation of Health Devices and Medicines. And this session will be moderated by Kun Kawaldip Semi, our CEO of uh, IAPO. And our speakers are Kun Finni Leo, APEC Regional Regulatory Policy Lead, Roach. Kun Einstein Rojas, board member, Philippines Alliance of Patient Organizations. Kun Chalem Sak, Kitti Dragoon. Project Manager for Access of Medicines, Thai Network of People Living in Living with HIV AIDS. Uh, we have two speakers uh, on the program. Kun uh, Natalie Baer, uh, Baer uh, Patient Engagement Specialist, European Medicines Agency, and uh, Kun Russell Williams, Senior Vice President, Mission Diabetes Canada. Uh, they are unable to join us today in person, but have kindly sent us their pre-recorded uh, presentations. Um, you can find their full biographies, of course, on the 4th Asia-Pacific Patient Congress page on IAPO website. Before we get started, we invite you to submit your questions to the speakers, whether you are in here, in person, or online. If you are joining us online, you can send your question via the Q&A tab by the virtual stage. We now invite our moderator, Kun Kawadip, to take the floor. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much. Um, this is the last session of the day. I know we're all tired, but thank you for sticking with us. But it's a very important session. Uh, this is a session about how do we regulate healthcare? Uh, as you saw, we begin the week or the, the, uh, this uh, APC 2022. On day one, we discussed that we have a vision our vision is to have a predictive, preventative, participatory, personalized, and preemptive healthcare. This healthcare can only be achieved if you've got everything working together in synchronicity. We saw how value based healthcare and health technology assessment was very important for us to evaluate these technologies so that they're made available to as many patients as possible in the earliest time in an affordable manner. We then we looked at the way patient safety issues have to be addressed and worked with uh, in all this. And lastly, I think what remains now to be looked at is how do we improve over regulation? As you know, from uh, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, uh, everybody became, for the first time, aware of how regulation works. Uh, many people, for the first time, understood what an emergency license was, what's a clinical trial, what's a safety trial, what's first-in-man trial. Um, as you know, when AstraZeneca uh, came, it was a major significant moment. You had 1,000 cameras in a little hospital in London where uh, the nurse, uh, Sarah uh, Jenkins, was injected with this um, uh, vaccine. And I think everybody understood why first in man is important as a trial. Then we looked at other things. And as the uh, event went on, we began to realize there are many issues, many stages in regulation. So it's important for us to make sure that we shape the regulation we want. Patients should be shaping this regulatory framework. It's important for us. One of the things that we have found out is new agilities. Uh, agilities uh, that we have discovered is how to work collectively. 
the government, the regulator, the patients, and the industries have learned to work in new patterns. We have worked on new agility. I mean, from 2020, when we had uh, everybody present at our virtual Global Patients Congress, uh, the IFPMA uh, chairman, um, uh, Thomas Queenie, said, I will have a vaccine ready in six months. And I think we were all kind of quizzical, but he got it underway in three months, and the three months was a clinical trial and brought it over. So this session is all about that. How do we shape the regulatory uh, um, framework on this? Uh, can I now uh, suggest uh, if I could invite uh, all the speakers on board, please do come on. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, somebody joining us from uh, online as well, Russell Williams uh, and uh, Natalie Baer, who is from the European Medicines Agency. Uh, Natalie Baer is on a sabbatical at the moment. Uh, she's in uh, New Zealand, but she's thankfully given us a good recording. And as has uh, Russell, uh, who was here uh, sometime back during the APAC uh, regulatory framework. Now, it's important for us to realize that uh, artificial intelligence has got a role to play in uh, helping us get to some of the most patient-centric solutions we can get. We know digital health has a big role to play in making our life a lot easier, making us, uh, giving us the right things, making, uh, helping us personalize healthcare. I will now ask um, Finney to come and speak to us. Uh, he's been the APAC regional regulatory policy lead for Roche. Uh, Finney, over to you first. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to speak on regulatory harmonization and reliance in APEC. We know that uh, access is a global challenge, especially for the low and medium income countries. And based on the estimation from WHO, one third of the patients have no access to essential medicines. And one of the biggest reasons for this kind of limited access is because the efficient regulatory systems. So how can we collectively uh, build up a good regulatory system to meet the patient's need? We know that the patients are waiting for new treatment new solutions. So the key is to establish uh, an efficient regulatory system. How? It's through the regulatory harmonization, reliance, and networks. So what does uh, regulatory convergence and reliance mean? It's a pro voluntary process that the regulatory requirement in one country is moving towards a uh, similar and also more aligned. And how can the regulators uh, work towards reliance, uh, work uh, through the re regulatory convergence and harmonization is to follow the international uh, guidelines and standards. Okay, uh, so who are working on regulatory convergence and harmonization? If we look at uh, the uh, regulatory uh, environment for pharmaceutical product, there are three key uh, global uh, organizations who are driving for regulatory convergence and harmonization. I think everyone knows WHO. And there is also uh, in ICMI. ICMI is the International Coordination of uh, Medicine Regulatory Agency. So they are around more than uh, 30 regulatory authority. They work together 
to set the strategic direction for regulatory harmonization. And there is also a very important organization, ICH. ICH is the International Council for Reg uh, uh, Harmonization. ICH was established in 1990, so you can see that it's more than 30 years now. And what is the uh, way that ICH are driving towards harmonization? ICH is very unique because they have members both from the health authority and industry. So industry and regulator work together and discuss and set regulatory guidelines for the members or the international regulator to follow. Just to name a few of the uh, guidelines that has been established by ICH, such as good clinical practice, good manufacturing practice, or product validation, product stability. And if we look back more than 30 years ago, uh, Japan has their unique uh, drug registration requirement. EU and US, they also have their own requirement. So at that time, when a drug was developed in Japan, usually they cannot fulfill the registration requirement in EU and US. Same, if a drug is manufactured or developed by US and EU, usually the requirement uh, followed by US and EU could not fulfill the requirement in Japan. So this was the background why ICH was established because it's a big pro it was a big challenge for uh, the patient over all the world to get access to new drug at the same time be because there was no harmonized or similar regulation. And there is also a group, IPRP, is a group of regulator, uh, it's International Pharmaceutical Regulatory Program. So this uh, uh, organization, they have the regulator, they meet and talk together and share their experience and see how they can implement the regulation and work towards a harmonized uh, regulation. And what is most important uh, uh, and relevant to A Asia Pacific is APEC APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Collaboration. In APEC, there is a group uh, called uh, Regulatory Harmonization Steering Committee. And this RHSC uh, is also a, a group uh, uh, where we have regulators industry and academia. And how the RHC work uh, towards uh, harmonization is that they do not set up guidelines. They just follow WHO guidelines and ICH guidelines. And then they work with some academia uh, uh, association such as a university or some health authority. And they establish the center of regulatory excellence uh, and provide training to regulators for this, to implement this kind of regulation. And in ASEAN, there is a group called PPWG, Pharmaceutical Product Working Group. So uh, PPWG focuses on establish the common regulation for ASEAN countries. So, so far they have already established the ASEAN Variation Guideline and also uh, the Mutual GMP Inspection and also BABE requirement guideline. So these are the example of the uh, regulatory convergence efforts in the field of pharma. And in the medical device field, there are also a few global organizations working on uh, the regulatory harmonization. One is WHO, the other is a global harmonization working group. And the other one is International Medical Device Regulatory uh, Regulator Forum. And also in the medtech field, APA, APEC and also ASEAN also have the, uh, are also re uh, taking care of the regulatory convergence in medtech. So in ASEAN, there is also another working group focused on medical device. And the uh, RHC under APEC covers medical device as well. So uh, what is regulatory reliance? is the act where uh, 
the regulatory authority in one jurisdiction would take into consideration and put significant weight to the assessment performed by another regulatory authority. But uh, although they are re referring to the assessment done by the other health authority, but the uh, countries still have their own uh, decision-making power to decide whether they would approve the drug or not. So uh, what are the regulatory collaboration based on the convergence and reliance? Through regulatory convergence and reliance, the regulator can build up different way of collaboration. One is to have the information sharing. So uh, we know that sometimes it's very challenging for the regulator to collect safety signal. So many health authorities have built up the connection to share the information with each other. So when, once there is a safety signal identified by a health authority, they share with each other so that the regulator can very quickly react to any uh, safety signal that they identified. The other uh, collaboration is work sharing. Work sharing means uh, the regulator, they are not reviewing the do uh, re drug registration dossier alone. Some regulator may just re review part of the dossier and the other review the, the, the other part of the dossier. And of course, the regulatory convergence can lead to uh, regulatory reliance because if a country have different regulation with the reference country, they cannot rely on the, the other country because the regulation are very different. And under the reliance pathway, there is also a reliance pathway, we call it recognition. So we just mentioned the reliance pathway is to take into the consideration of the assessment report uh, written by the other health authority. The recognition is actually usually through a treaty so that uh, one health authority approve a drug, the other would also approved without a really uh, go through the review process for the, for the dossier. So these are all the kinds of the way that health authority can quickly react to the uh, product registration. So how does it work? If you look at this uh, slide, for the stringent regulatory authority, we usually mean uh, US uh, FDA, EU EMA, or Japan PMDA, or Canada, Australia. They usually would review the whole dossier of the product, and it's hundreds of thousands of pages. So how, you can imagine if uh, the, our regulator in APEC have to review so many pages of the uh, product uh, registration dossier, it will really take them a lot of time. Besides, there are many uh, innovative products which are very uh, new, they may not really have the capacity to see whether they should approve this kind of drug. So the reliance pathway is to uh, use the assessment report uh, written by the stringent regulatory authority. And then the health authority who rely on those countries would just review the assessment report, which is around 100 page. And then they will make their own decision uh, after they review the, the assessment report. And through reviewing the assessment report, they will be able to see what are the uh, thinking in, uh, in those stringent uh, regulatory authority. And they can also learn how to review a new drug by reviewing the assessment report written by the uh, reference countries. So the beauty of the reliance uh, on the stringent regulatory authority is that the regulator not only can reduce their review time, they can also learn from the uh, assessment uh, from the uh, stringent reg regulatory authority. Uh, what are the opportunities for the reliance? Actually, uh, for reliance, I mentioned previously, if uh, the regulations are not harmonized or convergent, and then it will be challenging to implement the reliance. And also, for the regulator to feel comfortable to rely on the other health authority, they also need to build up trust. You don't really rely on someone that you don't trust, right? So it's very uh, critical that the regulator also need to build up trust uh, with each other. And how can they build up trust? It's through the capacity building uh, 
we know that uh, there are also a lot of uh, regulators meeting where the regulators meet together and also learn from each other. So that's also why we mentioned about to strengthen the regulatory system. Network is also a very critical element. And this is just a, a quick view uh, uh, to show where are the countries uh, that has already established reliance uh, pathway for the pharmaceutical product. And you can see there are a lot of uh, health authorities in Asia, such as uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, Taiwan, uh, and also uh, they, we already have the re reliance pathway. And I would like to share a recent experience we had uh, uh, at Roche. We just got a new drug in the Philippines uh, this month. And we submit that new drug application to the Philippine FDA in July after, uh, through the Reliance Pathway. So totally, it only took us four months to get a new drug approved. It was like a, a big <laughs> surprise for us because usually it takes one to two years to approve a new drug in the Philippines. So you can see how much difference it, it is uh, after the Philippines uh, health authority implemented a reliance pathway. So uh, kudos to the Philippine health authority and the pe uh, people in the Philippines. Okay, in the field of medical device, there are not many countries where they have the reliance pathway. So far we have the uh, uh, reliance pathway for medical device in Singapore and Australia. And currently, uh, Singapore and Thailand are under through some pilot projects on Reliance. But because we are talking about uh, the digital technology and AI machine learning or the software as medical device, I just want to quickly share with you uh, where uh, we have the regulation available for regulating such product. You can see a lot of countries are located in Asia. So, so you can see uh, we are actually much more advanced in, in other regions because the IT technology in, in APEC is really very advanced. Okay, the key message I would like to share here is regulatory runs can represent a valuable tool to accelerate the registration of the new technology and also the new drug for vulnerable group. And we also mentioned about COVID-19 is a strong uh, accelerator for the use of reliance. At the very, before the COVID uh, pandemic, some health authorities are still thinking uh, whether they would like to implement a reliance because they may not really feel so comfortable. However, because of the pandemic, they need to react very fast. So we see that for the vaccine or pandemic relevant product, the majority of the health authority in the international market quickly approve the pandemic vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine, and also the drug treatment through Reliance. That means when they see the uh, vaccine or the product are approved by uh, the US or e EU, Japan, or the vaccine has been listed in the uh, em emergent use authorization list in WHO, then they would just uh, approve the EUA in, in their country. Uh, what we would like to say is that uh, because digital health is a very unique topic, it's not like the traditional medical device. So the regulator really need to uh, make positive steps in involving their regulatory uh, framework. Why is so different? You, you know, if we look at the drug product, it's developed by pharmaceutical companies. And for the traditional medical device, they are also developed by medical device company. But how about the software as medical device, AI, or machine learning? Many of these products are not developed by, by the traditional medical device company. They may be divide, uh, re, uh, developed by some IT company or some technology company or ha hospital. <laughs> so how could uh, they understand the regulatory framework to make their product really uh, available for the launch uh, for patient. So uh, we also need to highlight here, patient needed to be engaged in the discussion so that the regulators would know 
uh, what's their accountability and know that they need to uh, accelerate Reliance's uh, pathway to support the early uh, approval for the new technology and new drug and also to reflect the true needs of the patient. So this is all I would like to share here and thank you for your listening. Uh, thank you very much, Finney. I think um, Finney gave you the very good reasons as to why we need to be involved as patients. I think we need to design uh, appropriate uh, regulatory systems to what we need. So let's make regulatory systems that work for us rather than against us. It's important that we are involved in the design, uh, make sure that these regulatory systems respect patient safety plus also patient engagement. And also the time element of uh, 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 regulatory approval. As we will go into the future as new health technologies are merging, uh, more and more we'll have to approve uh, these health technologies as fast and uh, as soon as possible and to ensure that they are accurately defined and are safe for us. Patients, as you said, you, uh, very often people say you deserve the political system that you have. Similarly, we deserve the regulatory system we have. We have to make it better for us. Uh, we can't uh, sit on the fence on this and we can't let it be designed for us. The next speaker uh, is a recording from um, Natalie Baer. As I said, uh, Nelly Bay is speaking uh, from New Zealand. She's uh, on a sabbatical there. But Nelly has been involved with the European Medicine Agency for a long time and improved patient and consumer working parties and engagement within them. Whilst um, Finney was talking about regulatory reliance in independent sovereign countries uh, to buy uh, bipartisan agreements or to uh, single agreements or one-to-one. -one. The European Medicines Agency is established by the Treaty of uh, uh, European Unions. There are several treaties there. And you can see here national medicines regulatory agencies have all come together and I call it the super reliance model where 27, uh, it used to be 28 with the UK in it, all the 28 uh, countries had worked together and applied the principle of regulatory reliance. And things happened so fast. You could register a product in France and let the French uh, regulatory agency deal with it quickly and get uh, um, and given approval, then that applies across the union. If the, if the Swiss, uh, sorry, if the Swedish are very fast in some, say, genomic medicine, let them do that most appropriate. Similarly, we have now in Africa, in Africa, the African Medicine Agency is coming on board, and we hope to see that they apply the same principle. So without much ado, let's hear from Natalie Baer and explain to us how this is constructed and how it has been working. Thank you. Presenting to you today at this very important conference. I'm going to be giving an overview of how patients are engaged at the European Medicines Agency. I've worked at the EMA for many years, um, however I'm on sabbatical since uh, September of this year. I'm spending some time in New Zealand. So the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, um, in Europe is really the, the medicines regulator uh, for Europe. Uh, it's very similar, of course, to the FDA in uh, the US and TGA in Australia. So its role is really to make sure that medicines are safe and effective for um, European citizens. Now, at EMA, patients are involved in many of its activities, and um, I'll be explaining a little bit about that uh, later in the presentation, but really just to say that they are an integrated part of EMA's work. Everybody is used to having them participate, to listening to their perspectives, and really being able to benefit from um, their important insights. Now, this hasn't happened overnight, of course. Uh, it's been a progressive journey. We've tried to learn together with the patient community what is the best way to 
involve them. Uh, we started some early dialogue when we opened back in 95. Then patients started to become members of some of our committees. Uh, we developed our framework of interaction, which serves for the basis on how we engage. We set up the Patients and Consumers Working Party. Uh, a dedicated department on public engagement at EMA was then set up. And we continued working to really make sure that we had the opportunities in place to be able to listen to and gather that information from patients and use it into all of our different uh, work aspects. It was important to make sure that there were opportunities to listen to patients on the different phases of the medicine's life cycle. So there is the pre-submission phase when the medicine is in development, the evaluation phase when EMA is evaluating that medicine's application to be put on the market, and then post-authorization phase when we're making sure that those medicines are still safe and effective once they are being used. And patients are involved in many different ways along this life cycle. So they are full members of some of EMA's committees. They participate in uh, expert meetings, for example, scientific advice when companies ask for advice on their development plans, when maybe one of the committees is uh, convening an expert meeting during an evaluation, or even uh, safety uh, reviews in the post-marketing phase. Some of these things take place face-to-face -face at the EMA, some are virtual and others are online um, or in writing, for example, reviewing documents. It's also very important to make sure that the documents EMA prepares are clear and understandable for the patient community, so we also send those to review for them, like package leaflets or safety communications. So really making sure that patients are involved in all the different aspects at the EMA, not just at the end or in the middle, but right from the beginning. I mentioned earlier the framework, and this is an important document which is adopted by EMA's management board, and it really establishes the basis to make sure that we have the ability to access patients' real-life experience and include them in our um, discussions. Also to make sure that we can generate, collect, and use evidence-based patient experience data. Um, and also to make sure that from our side we can provide information to patients so that they can understand the different decisions that EMA is taking and why they've been taken. This also helps to increase trust um, in the system and making sure that we communicate in an efficient and targeted manner. We have two working parties, so we have the Patients and Consumers Working Party, but we also have the Healthcare Professionals Working Party, and these working parties work very much hand in hand together. Um, we found that so many of the discussions are relative to both groups, and actually both groups also find a huge benefit to listen to each other um, and hear what their perspectives are. So we have very lively, dynamic discussions um, and very tangible input into all the different activities where they are involved at EMA. We meet four times a year with them, um, but they also come to workshops, information sessions, and we have dedicated topic groups on areas that we are currently working on. Now, of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this uh, engagement if we didn't have uh, a network of uh, organizations and individuals across the whole of Europe. So we have a system where any patient consumer organization can express an interest to work with EMA and we have an eligibility criteria on our website and if that is met then they become um, what we call an eligible organization and they're listed on our website and of course YAPO is one of these organizations. But we also wanted to make sure that individuals had an opportunity to register with us, um, either to work with us to get involved in the activities or just to receive um, targeted information uh, in an area that they're interested in. And again, there's also an application on our website and there are links here. We had to ensure as well that um, on, the one side, on the one side, we have a range of methodologies to engage with patients. So as I mentioned earlier, coming to face-to-face -face meetings, perhaps providing input in writing, being at the committee meetings, sometimes wider surveys so we can hear from the larger community and also patient preferences, so a more quantitative way of gathering information. But that won't work if we don't provide appropriate support and training. So everybody who gets involved can um, receive proper uh, and 
adequate training. We have training days, we have information sheets, videos, web pages. People like to learn in different ways. But we also, of course, have one-to-one -one support when anyone comes to get involved to make sure that they understand what EMA is, what does EMA do, what activity are they getting involved in, what is their role in that particular activity, and really support to make sure that they can provide optimal input um, and into that particular activity. We continue to monitor and um, you know, check that the way we are engaging and involving patients is working well from all perspectives. So we've done some uh, research into the different activities. One activity was scientific advice, so this is where patients are involved in the um, uh, activities related to the development of a medicine when companies come and ask. And we did a four-year study where we looked at how often patients um, contributed where that made a difference. And we found that around 20% of the times when patients are involved, that makes a concrete change to the advice that is given. Um, and also quite often patients agreed with the development plan, so that was also uh, something that was very beneficial. When they review the documents, about 50% of their comments are taken into account. And we recently did a, a, another survey within our evaluation committee where patients were invited to share things they felt were important with the committee. And when we surveyed the committee afterwards, many of them said that it was very insightful information and it contributed to the development of their first assessment report. And also into the safety monitoring. We have public hearings where we listen to all members of the public and what they have told us has really helped shape then the recommendations and outcomes afterwards. So just to conclude, um, at EMA, engaging with patients is crucial, and it's crucial to do that along the whole life cycle of a medicine. Having the various data sources, so from the clinical trials to being able to listen to patients directly, results in having safer and more effective medicines for everyone. Only patients know what it's like to listen um, to live with uh, a condition. Only though they know what they would hope for in a new medicine. What are their unmet needs? What are the challenges they face on a day-to-day -day basis? And the many benefits of involving patients far outweigh any challenges that are involved. And by involving patients, we increase transparency, awareness, and understanding of the regulatory discussions and outcomes. And hopefully this increases trust in the system. So anyone out there uh, starting to engage or who already engages and wants to further enhance, we always say to try and work together with the community, work in a stepwise approach so you can learn together what format works best, how you can optimally get that information in a two-way uh, manner. Define everybody's roles, manage expectations, and make sure engagement is mutually beneficial. At the end of the day, everyone has a role to play, um, and everyone should benefit from the engagement. So thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, as you saw, Natalie really, really uh, has worked really hard for the European Medicines Agency and has put in some strong frameworks and she's been a patient champion making sure we are always called to all the discussions to be had. And it's a model of working, I think, and it's very important for us here in the region to establish the same links with our National Medicines Regulatory Agency. And the main word there was that there are many more benefits than challenges of engaging patients within the regulatory agency. So we must remind them that, that there are benefits. Now, without much ado, uh, we're now going to the next section which is of concern to every health system globally. We, we have heard of artificial intelligence. Uh, we have got myths about artificial intelligence. What can it do? At the same time, we actually link far too much sometimes uh, emphasis, thinking artificial intelligence will solve all of our problems. It's a tool, and like any other tool, it can do certain things to limitation. It can do certain things very well. But we have to look at those very uh, uh, in depth. With every health technology, uh, you have to look at uh, how it impacts society, 
how it uh, interacts with patients. Uh, are there immediate uh, patient safety issues, which means uh, by use of it, it doesn't worsen your condition or put you at risk. But more importantly, how is it protecting you for other things like from confidentiality and data? As you saw when the COVID was raging, we had uh, track and trace in, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Some economies like Korea, Taiwan were happy to use even your credit card details to notify you if you have been exposed. In other places, there were lots of uh, debates about uh, security, et cetera, or the citizens' rights. So all that had to be uh, balanced up. Uh, I will now in, invite, um, uh, again, Einstein um, Rojas uh, from the PAPO to talk about this. And Einstein is very well read on this and really understands this topic well. Einstein, over to you. Thank you very much, Kawaldeep, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for staying here for the Asia-Pacific Conference. I'd like to start by introducing myself as part of the presentation will be wearing multiple perspectives from different uh, hats. I'm a board member of the Philippine Alliance of Patient Organization. That is my advocacy hat. I was with the John Hopkins to train with the road safety and tobacco control advocacy. And my corporate hat, I'm, wearing, I'm a, an, an innovation venture architect where we design products and services that benefits the people. The third hat is I'm a family person. I don't have a child yet, but I love my parents and do everything I can to help them uh, do this advocacy. I always start my presentation by defining the role of patients. This came from the UPATI session where you see patients, not just only patients, but you have to look at them with five segments of categories. First is the individual patients, who is the one who is suffering from the disease. Second is the patient care, who takes, the, who takes care of the patient. Patient advocates are the members of the patient organizations. Patient organization representatives are the ones who has this collective view and opinions of each specific organization. While patient experts help all of these market segments to understand them, to create them to a data-driven decision that will help connect the language of policymakers and researchers. This is also related to Ms. Nithi a uh, presentation where it could be a researcher or an advisor as a patient. I'd like to share this. Sh I'd like to share this slide with you. The times are changing. You can see here at the primary care family doctors that the baby boomer generation trusts them very much. However, if you look at the Gen X, the millennial, and up to the Gen Z. Who are they trusting? They are not trusting their primary care anymore. Rather, you can look at Mr. Google, or rather, Dr. Google. Perhaps we could also be looking at more integrative technologies such as the social medias, which is often used as a research for their specific needs and their specific pains. This slide, I want to share to you a framework called strategic foresight. You can look at this as an artificial intelligence, but it has a framework to help you have a glimpse of the future. This is a survey among top executives globally where what, which among of their efforts in their foresight predicts the most and help them strategize and shape their uh, corporate objectives moving forward. And it shows here that the changing consumer behaviors who uses foresight gives the biggest return of investment in their studies. While new regulations and compliance requirements affects their objective, but it does not shape their industry and their strategies. 
Now, using strategic foresight, this came from the Institute of uh, Foresight Organization, where they predicted the future of the pandemic, entitled After the Pandemic, A Deeper Disease. You can see at the root of the problem are broken health systems, racial injustice, political divisions, and others. What I want you to focus on are the four seg big circles above. The saving capitalists are being led by the industry, which leads to a different kind of growth, but a collaborative one will lead us into a social solidarity, which the social solidarity emphasizes on valuing social well-being and leveraging mutuality. At the baseline of it, it, there is a mutual understanding of it. And the response is always a reset and a reinvention of oneself. I like to share to you this slide because we're not only looking at companies who invest in healthcare and who are healthcare companies. We should also be aware that non-healthcare companies are investing into healthcare. Well, my favorite example in this slide is actually Apple. Who here is wearing a wearable device made by Apple? Do you think those data will just stop by knowing your data consumption or your steps? Or perhaps Apple has a deeper plan which is to create an insurance company by 2024. You can also look at the Walmarts being an everyday low prices for primary health care. So we should be aware of this kind of innovations and they use artificial intelligence that came from patients without them knowing and allowing them to do so. Going to our region, the AI adoption is still at its infancy stage. The Southeast Asia, specifically the Philippines, has particularly very small investments towards healthcare, specifically on AI adoption. It shows here that the, ASEAN, uh, the Southeast Asian region countries invested on transportation and logistics, artificial intelligence data gathering. This adapted into manufacturing, retail, and hospitality, while healthcare is one of their other priorities that needs to be prioritized. Philippines has an investment of over 12% economic impact, a projection on, by 2030 of over $92 billion. And this is not coming from just um, from NGOs, but also from startups and industry alike. I'd like to share to you this agile methodology framework, wherein users can be part of the brainstorming session at day one. You might be wondering, why are the large companies progressing so much? They use this kind of thinking where it's embed combined with design thinking and agile development, where the users or patients can be at the center of each developmental phase. So it doesn't mean that if you're a patient, you can only see the product or service at the very end. There is a model that you can be part of the development process at day one. Here's also another pro, uh, framework that you would love to use, um, where it encompasses desirability, viability, feasibility as the main component. But if you're looking for the innovation sweet spot, you have to have integrity and how to measure impact with your programs. Now, all this technology doesn't mean a lot if the corporate or the industry is leading us. We should look at the concerns of the patients using a causal layer analysis, where, yes, technology is here. We're very excited to understand, uh, we are very excited to use it, but 
it's really we really find it hard to understand and adopt it with all this adoption to technology using different devices have to manu manually code it but the deeper meaning of this in the causal layer analysis which touches on the system's thinking while this is convenient who holds the data of uh, the patients who is responsible if my data leaks out in the philippines during the pandemic you, you when you enter a mall or a hospital you have to input your mobile number few months later advertisements from different companies flooding your text messages a deeper concern towards the data or the technology adoption is the overall law that governs the system this could be a concern through discrimination of access this is also prominent in the philippines where not all people are equal uh, has equal access with technology but overall this eventually is any health context ju literally just need health literacy or through em patient empowerment and this patient empowerment can be seen as different things but i want what i want to drive the message here is that to build on trust as that's one of the main concerns of uh, patients and by building this i want to push for patients to be involved at day one so here in our, my last slide we have a patient academy in the Philippines. We're testing it with design uh, business concept by a business school, which is a postgraduate certificate in healthcare leadership and management. This is a capacity building program for patient champions to be part of the local health board. And soon we hope to integrate this as a system to be part of the government that is a prerequisite to understand the patient needs to understand the approaches, the innovative approaches, including design thinking and agile methodology as part to, be, to become before a local health board. And with that, I hope our patients will be more involved, not just with the technology, but you can use foresight, you can use agile methodology, you can use design thinking, and you can be part of the design of these products or services at day one. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Einstein. I think Einstein did a really good job of this because we couldn't find a better speaker on this, I think, uh, with better knowledge. And all the aspects, you know, being part of the patient, I could get an academic to say the same, but we wouldn't have got that insight on what patients think like. So Einstein brings that uh, very happy uh, mixture of uh, relating it to us. He can uh, describe the principles, but more importantly, he can then elaborate them to our specific situation and then conclude quite effectively as to what should be done. So Einstein has laid out the map for you. Now let's see what a patient thinks of this, or patient representative thinks of this. Uh, I've got uh, here with me, again, uh, Shalomask uh, Kitarulka. Sorry about my pronunciation. And he will talk for uh, a Thai network of people living with HIV AIDS. And I, as you know, th this is a community that has long history of act issues of access to safe drugs of regulation. Uh, currently, if it's PrEP or before that antiretroviral drugs, they've gone through the whole gamut. And they were good advocates. I think they developed the rule book on av advocacy. So let's hear from that uh, particular group how they envisage this and what it impacts on them. We must rely on those who built the pathway for us. I think. Uh, if there is an advocacy pathway, it's done by our groups who have worked hard on this one. Over to you. Thank you. Um, 
Good afternoon. Swati Kap, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm here to tell you about stories, story of a big group of people who, are, who have been fighting for access to medicine. I'm talking about a network of people living HIV AIDS in Thailand. Uh, what I'm talking about, I'm just going to tell you their story, their experiences on how they advocate with the person maker to ensure that they can access to essential medicine at affordable prices. Uh, since Thailand has a um, crisis in terms of HIV more than 500,000 people have been dying since the um, AIDS no, no, the, the occurred in, in, in this country. And this, the picture have you, you are seeing is the um, picture of the group of people living as we is They make a protest at their midst of public health. They stay there for three days and three nights, asking the government to do something to address you know, the access to antiretroviral at the time. The problem is not about we don't have the medicine available. We had the medicine available, but the price is so expensive, and no one can afford to buy it. So they go to the Mr. Bakel asking them to make use of a law to import or either produce generic version of entire retroviral medicine for the Thai people. It's happened in the year 1999, a long time ago. But at the time, the government denied to make use of that law. But anyway, they tried to address the problem by to asking the other agencies to do something. But before that, the group of people living in HIVAIDS tried to make use of a patent law to challenge the patent system, to challenge the Department of Intellectual Property, to challenge the drug company. I'm talking about one antiretroviral medicine. It's called didonacin or DDI. It's all drugs for, for now. But at the time, it's a very few drugs that can be used to the treat HIV at that time. The price is very expensive. It's patented in Thailand. But we have to look at at that pattern, and we found something wrong with that. The people living in HVNS don't believe that this medicine is qualified to get patented. So we filed a lawsuit against the Department of Intellectual Property and the drug company, its name is BMS at that time. So it's take about five year time in the, in, in, in the court. And at the end of the day, the drug company make decision to withdraw the patent on this medicine of Thailand. So it's allowed. You know, the other company can produce the medicine or import from the other countries. So that, that the first um, fighting that we try to, you know, advocate for access to medicine. And at the time, as we call the government to do something to make use of a law, but they denied it, but they assigned the state um, manufacturer they call the government pharmaceutical organization, or GPO, to look at the drugs that is a patent or have no patent in Thailand. And they have found three medicines have no patent problem in Thailand. So they start to do R&D to make the combination of the three drugs in one pill, or we call it a cocktail, the ARV. And, we, and, and the GPO was successful to do that. And this is the, the story that has been told in the Broadway theater. They make use of the case of Thailand to do like a, the, the Broadway play. They call it cocktail and bring the, the situation in Thailand to do that. And have you, is a thanks to the, the, the one who made it happen, the Dr. Kisana Kaisen too at the time. She is the director of the R&D section of the GPO Try to make it happen and reduce the price quite a lot then it's more than 80% cheaper than the original medicine at the time. So this is the, the way that government tried to solve the problem after they got the pressure from the civil society. And people living in HNVL, 
network, they think that it's, not, it's, it's, it's only the short-term solution, how to make the long-term solution. We look at you know, how to make Thailand have the universal health coverage scheme. So we do a, a national campaign calling the government to legislate a law. We call the health security, the health security law. And it has been the, uh, adopted by the parliament. And at the time, the civil society has submitted a draft of this law together with the other drafts that are proposed by the politician. And you know, after the year 2004, Thailand have the universal health care scheme according to this law. And by this law, it means that all the Thai people can access to health care services at no cost. So it's all free for all Thai. But at the beginning, we had a problem because the government afraid that it had a great impact in terms of budget because the price of medicine for HVNA is quite expensive. So ARV has not been included at the time. When the system, I mean the USA system, has been put in place for more than one year, so we do another campaign asking the government, the prime minister, to recognize the need of people living in this for ARV included in the USC. And you know, it's the same time that GBO was a set full in terms of producing the cocktail version of ARV available. So it has been a proof to the government that access to ARV is possible. The price is not expensive because we have a generic version available and we can locally produce it. So the PM and the Prime Minister at the time decide you know, to include antiretroviral treatment in the healthcare system under the USC. So it means that you know, ARV is available. But the problem is not to you know, stop. We still have the other need. We have a large number of people living as it is, have the experience the, on the drug resistance because they have no knowledge about how to take the medicine properly and create another problem. We have a problem in terms of drug resistance. The medicine that produced by GPO is not enough. They have a large number of people who need second line and third line ARV also. And when we have a Dr. Mongkona Songkha, who was the Mr. Apapikel at the time, and he know about this problem, and he the first minister of public health that brave enough to make use of the public health safeguard that we call compulsory licensing. To issue that is allow Thailand to import and locally produce the you know, second line the, uh, ARV for Thai people, and also it's expand to the other medicine as well. I'm talking about the medicine to treat. Uh, CVD or cardiovascular diseases, and also other four kinds of cancer as well. So it has been recognized worldwide that Thailand did a good job in terms of ensuring people can access to medicine at affordable price. And all this medicine has been included in the national the healthcare insurance. So it means it's for free for all Thai people. And it's the, we have do lots of advocacy work in Thailand. We have recognized that we are just not only working with the policy maker, but also we work with doctor. We also working with the manufacturer, and also even the drug the declaration agency as well. In terms of doctor, we work with them very closely to ensure that new world ARV has been included in the national treatment guideline, so that the first door that had opened open because we get the support from the expert, from the doctor, that what supposed to be the ARV regimen available in the you know, Thailand healthcare system. And then we also advocate with the government, with the Minister of Public Health, with the National the Security Office as well, to ensure that we have enough budget to support and purchase the, you know, this medicine for the people. And uh, what I'm talking about next, I would like to focus more on how we work with the drug regulatory to how, how to make it available. The first experience we work with the FDA, or the Thai Food and Drug Administration, is that um, we have a number of medicines that need to be approved, I mean the market approved, to the make it available in the country. But due to many reasons, it makes the process quite uh, the lengthy process. So we have to advocate with them how to solve the problem. 
And, and the solution is that they're going to create a fast track that to approve for the drug legislation. But anyway, this medicine is supposed to be a targeted medicine. It means the essential medicine that we need in this country. So it's not the, the, the system has been put in place already. And another system that we have worked with, we try to advocate with the National Assistant Drug List Committee that had a very crucial duty because this committee had a duty to the examine and also approve the medicine to include in the National Assistant Drug List. If it included in this list, it means that all the hospital, state hospital, can prescribe to their patients for free at no cost. So it's a quite crucial. So we this, make use of this mechanism as well to ensure that essential medicine has been included in the list and included in the health benefit package under the USC system. And um, next one I would like to talk about uh, is about the free trade agreement negotiation. Uh, we have a concern a lot on this kind of trade agreement because it's going to have an impact it's going to interfere the duty of the FDA because if we accept some regulation in that agreement, it's going to delay or it's a block uh, competition of the generic drug because you know the FDA will not able to accept or examine the drug registration request by the generic drug company. So that another should we did a lot of campaign to oppose this kind of free trade agreement negotiation, including between Thailand and European Union or even Thailand and the United States, for example. So that 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 the challenge that we have got so far. And um, before I'm gonna end my the talk, I would like to mention some let's learn of, of this movement that uh, is very crucial for the civil society, for the patient network that have to work very closely with the policy maker. If you would like to make sure that you know, your medicine or your the medication technology that you need is going to be included in the healthcare system you know, for in the long term. Last but not least, I would like to mention about the uh, drug regulatory uh, drug regulation agency as well. I think it's not easy for them and it's quite challenging for them as well to balance between access and safety and uh, efficacy because it's, 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 it needs to be done on a timely basis. I have recognized in terms of ARV medicine as well as a sample and recently also I have recognized in terms of COVID-19 pandemic because it's very crucial, because it's a new medicine and it's new drug, it's a new vaccine. So it's a, a lot of pressure put on the Thai FDA to do a job very quickly and to ensure safety and efficacy at the same time. So I think it's like, um, it's, a, it's a challenge for the, 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 the drug regulation agency like the FDA. So once again, I think that the, the engagement of the people living as network and the other patient network uh, is important in terms of how to advocate with the policymaker to ensure access to affordable medicine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shalaman. I have now um, to conclude on this um, uh, session. As you saw this morning, there are two things we have to make very clear. The regulatory pathway is one issue whereby you do an assessment of a product intensively, look at its efficacy, look at how it performs, how it benefits, how it's low risk, and which formulations to be in. That's one. Then the second component I think people some, sometimes confuse is yes a drug will have a license you are licensing it but then the decision that you have to make is the other decision which is reimbursement which the last speaker was talking about a reimbursement and licensing are two different components they need to be discussed in isolation but then 
try to bring them together, the HT, uh, HTA or value-based engineer, uh, value-based uh, healthcare models together. In Europe, we are now working on this model that the European Medicine Agency assesses a drug for what its merits are, its efficacy, its safety, and looks at it thoroughly and then comes up with a recommendation. Meanwhile, the same dossiers, they want to share very early with the health technology assessment programs, STPA, which will make sure that this project, this program, or this drugs or development of drug or um, health devices, and then reimbursed by governments. Can we uh, pay for this and at what level and wh what is it? So those are the two decisions they're trying to bring together and ensure that they will lock in somehow. But you must remember there are two separate things. The first is a technical issue. It's an issue about efficacy and safety scientific issue. The second issue, whether this, how we access these patients, uh, who pays for it and how much and how do we pay for it, that is an economic and social uh, decision to make. That's for society to decide. And how we value certain drugs. As you saw, we now said genomic, genomic medicine is coming up the pipeline. You've got uh, models of um, health devices coming out and we, we should be ready for that. The last speaker today is chosen very accurately for this. As you know, the Asia-Pacific Economic uh, Corporation met here. Uh, APC, uh, APEC 2022 was a great occasion. It's all about economic cooperation in the area, making sure um, uh, health devices, drugs, uh, medicines are exchanged uh, across borders and effectively and under good regulatory systems, make sure there's a available for the benefit of all the cooperating bodies. We heard about, uh, again, regulatory reliance this morning, again, uh, very important. So now I will ask uh, Russell Williams, uh, who is the senior president of Diabetes Canada, but he's sitting on the a APEC patients um, corporations. Uh, over to Russell's video, please. Thank you, Ayako. Thank you very much for the opportunity for being here to participate in your conference. I'm Russell Williams. I'm the Senior Vice President of Mission Diabetes Canada. But today I'm honored to be with you in my capacity as patient co-chair of the APEC Biopharmaceutical Working Group on Business Ethics and APEC SME Initiatives. This initiative is the world's largest public private partnership to strengthen ethical business conduct in biopharmaceutical and medical device technologies and sectors. It brings together over 2,000 stakeholders from 19 APEC economies. This past September, the initiative hosted the 2022 APEC Business Ethics for SMEs Forum in Bangkok, Thailand. The forum brought together over 200 multi-stakeholders, including government, industry, healthcare professionals, and patient organizations. Since the initiative's start in 2011, we have been able to engage over 200 patient organizations from across the globe who share the same passion for advancing ethical business conduct. Patients are truly the only why in healthcare. As the ultimate consumers of health-related products and services, patients should be at the center of, of decision making for every relevant stakeholders whether it's industry, healthcare, professionals, providers, payers, or otherwise. Through the Business Ethics Initiative of APEC, patients and patient organizations serve as a central role in effective implementation of the APEC principles and serve as a vital member of consensus framework agreements for ethical cl collaboration within many APEC economies. I'd like to provide more context of how patients and patient organizations are contributing to the Vision 2025, the APEC Business Ethics for SME Initiative's strategic roadmap. First, in response to the APEC's Vision 2025 goals, patients and patient organizations in APEC published a patient action plan in which we committed to actions including the following. Adoption and implementation of consensus framework in each APEC economy by 2025. 
ensuring that the APEC and Kuala Lumpur and APEC Mexico City principle for voluntary codes of business ethics reflect the highest standards of ethical business practices. We also committed to disseminating guidance on patient and patient organizations' interactions with industry. And finally, communicating about the work of patient organizations within this initiative. Second, building on the vision, building on the vision 2025, one of the initiative's main opportunities for collaboration with patients and patient organizations is through direct engagement in consensus frameworks for ethical collaboration. Today, there exists 11 consensus frameworks in, in the APEC region and two outside the region, Brazil and Kenya. I applaud Thailand for their amazing progress in signing the Thailand consensus framework sometime this year. The work of the consensus frameworks is now a critical moment as we work to launch and implement consensus frameworks in the remaining 10 APEC economies by 2025. Patients remain key collaborators in consensus frameworks and continue to advocate for more representation and more meaningful representation in the consensus frameworks around the world. Finally, we continue to work to advocate for promoting the appropriate guidance on patient and patient organizations' interaction with, it, with industry, including SMEs, highlighting the role of patients and patient organizations to encourage ethical business contact and health systems, also in inclusion of all types of patient organizations, and finally, the accountability of industry and health st stakeholders for advancing ethical business practices. Other activities we have led include, in 2020, patients and patient organizations released a statement on the reinforcement of ethics and business integrity in the healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2021, the network contributed to an impact assessment on the value of doing business with, it, with integrity in the Asian Pacific region. We also provided guidance and expertise in the review and modernization of the APAC principles. In 2022 and 2023, we are looking to, to move forward with, to, and, and on with our initiative and strengthen our messaging and our communication materials about the work patients and patient organizations do and how to encourage effective business um, ethics throughout the entire health system. I invite you all to get in touch with us and get involved in the Business Ethics Initiative for APEC SMEs Initiative, and, and particularly from our net, in our network of patient organizations. I think you will all be inspired by the leadership of patient organizations and what we have done to move forward this important work. But we're going to need your help. We can all work together to advance the interests of patients to help advance ethical business practices. Thank you very much, and I hope to hear from you soon. That was uh, great, a great accent from um, Russell, who's always been our good friend and uh, representing us in APEC. I've got some questions now for our speakers. I think uh, uh, we won't let you go without uh, answering a few things, and I'll ask them from something from the audience. Um, the first question is uh, for Einstein. Um, um, You mentioned things about data collection and data use and data uh, storage. Do you think there's a likelihood or a danger of this data being misused? Short answer, yes. To tell you the truth, if you look at the patient journey or any customer journey, who really reads the fine print? Who really reads the terms and conditions unless it's explained to you? But with simply understanding that and not reading those fine prints and having no chance to talk about where it's going to be used, how it's going to be used, we will have lots of problem there. You are all wearing wearables right now. We didn't expect a company such as a large company like I mentioned a while ago to be 
investing in insurance. So I'm not sure if you call that misuse, but if you check the terms and conditions, and we must be very careful in doing so, in the most likelihood, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now the next question is for Finney. I think uh, this is, uh, we heard from Natalie Baer about the European medicines as an overarching body. We have uh, heard it from um, the African Medicines Agency we are talking about because we represent AMATA, which is the African Medicines Agency Treaty Alliance. We're trying to make sure this uh, body gets assembled. Do you think we do need a regulatory agency for APAC, maybe an APAC regulatory agency? Is there a need for it? Or should we rely or use the reliance method? Is there a need for an overarching body like European Medicines Agency, or is it a challenging uh, subject? Yes, thank you for this question. I think it will be uh, quite challenging to accept the uh, Asia Pacific uh, agency like EMA. If we look at the current situation, ASEAN is already trying to do this. Mm. And in Europe, it is different because they have a legal framework. They need to work together. But in ASEAN, uh, even though the regulator, they are working together to establish common guideline, but it's not mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the current challenge we are facing. Uh, but uh, we do see that there are some opportunities. So I did not have time to cover in my previous pre presentation. Uh, we talk about there are also uh, another model of reliance that is work sharing. Previously, we saw that uh, the reliance will only be adopted by some health authority who are lacking of resources or capacity. But now we are seeing uh, the US FDA or Canada, Australia, although they are quite competent and they have more regulators, they also feel that they are lacking of resource. So what they are currently doing is that they have established, <coughs> sorry, the work sharing model. So there is a group we call it, uh, called ACES Consortium. They have regulator from Singapore, Australia, UK, and also uh, Switzerland, Canada. What they, did, uh, what they are currently uh, doing is uh, when there is a new drug, we want to register, we can submit the drug uh, application through this access consortium. So once this uh, product has, uh, dossier has been submitted uh, to the access consortium, uh, some regulator uh, in this organization can decide the way that they would join the review process. And usually one regulator may be uh, responsible for reviewing the clinical part of the dossier. Some health authority may be responsible for looking at uh, the manufacturing uh, information. So this is the way that they are doing in sharing their workload. So I heard from some other uh, Asia regulator they are also thinking whether we could also establish this kind of work sharing uh, practice. But ideally, if we want to share the work, usually the regulators should be from the health authority that are having similar skill or competence. Okay. If you have a very mature regulators, and then we all, and if there is also some uh, developing health authority. Uh, the mature regulator, they would not uh, really uh, uh, trust the, uh, the, the review uh, from those uh, uh, regulators who are not really is, uh, competent enough. So I, I think sooner or later, we will see more and more uh, regulators, they team up okay. and have the work sharing uh, review process. Uh, th th thank you very much. A very diplomatic and very good answer, I think. As you say, in Europe, um, the main issue was trust, I think, and trust was developed after a very bad and vicious uh, Second World War, I think, as you know. 
uh, never had yet experienced something like that. And it was because of that that they established working together, first as an economic thing like coal and steel treaty, and then the European treaty, and then the Maastricht. So there was a series of treaties that were, so thank you. Now, for the patient represented, last question, short question again, for you now, I'd say, uh, should you be working with regulators or against regulators? Or should you be making room at the regulators or should be um, forcing your way into the regulators? What's your opinion on that? Um, actually, we cannot run away from each other. We have to work together and we try to understand each other. We try to communicate with them that why we ask for access, why we need access at the timely basis. And at this time, we have to understand the FDA staff as well, because their duty have to ensure safety and efficacy of the medicine. That's, that's the first job they have to do. Mm -hmm. So it's the time I try to bridge the gap to each other. We're working quite well at the last of two or four years that, that we try to, to, to understand each other. I think it's not that, as I told you, that we cannot run away from, from the Thai FDA. And at the same time, we try to, to support them as well. As I mentioned about the free trade agreement negotiation that Thailand has been doing with uh, many countries, because some country would like to propose some uh, what's called regulation that not allow the FDA to do good job. So we try to push this back and to support the FDA have, have to stand firm on your duty and not allow the other people to undermine your mm -hmm. duty. Yes. Thank, thank you much. Uh, that's very wonderful. That, thank you to hear that working together. As I say, if you work together, it's for better results. Uh, now, that's the end of this session. I must thank the speakers very well for having endured with this. Uh, I'm having some excellent uh, responses online. I think people really enjoy this session. And I think we'll take this forward into much detail for the next APPC. I'll put this again on the phone. So thank you very much for this. And I'll over, hand over to the Master of Summers.